Hi everyone, I'm John Taberham, the old boy from St James's Heritage and Environment Group. We've returned to the Lemton Gut, an old industrial backwater of the River Tyne. Old stories of a mysterious island, Canary Island, and young ladies known as the Lemington Canaries have us intrigued. Always up for a challenge, we therefore embark on the hunt for Canary Island and the Lemington Canaries. A visit to our friends at the West Newcastle Picture History Collection sets us on our way when we find a 1910 Leamington photograph identified as Canary Island. We view a bridge connection to the supposed island. A similar view six years later shows a much changed landscape with factories and warehouses stretching into the distance. The location is identified as the point, Canary Island. Through a 1936 Ordnance Survey map, we come across the location of the footbridge to Canary Island, identified by the red circle. Highlighted in yellow, we see the area is named as Lemington Point, or, as shown on the previous photo, the Point Canary Island. The map also shows Canary Island was not an island, merely a peninsula partially surrounded by tidal water. Finding a third West Newcastle Leamington photograph continues to fill in the gaps on our Canary mysteries. With a 1914 date we can identify these young ladies as World War I munitions workers. Is it possible we can provide a link to them and the Canary Island photographs? There would be great secrecy and a press blackout on anything related to the production of munitions in World War I. It would take a trawl through the munitions archives to provide a eureka moment. The Leamington Point erected buildings were in fact a secret shell filling factory. We have a double whammy when the information also identifies Armstrong Whitworth as the factory's overseers. In 1914, at the beginning of World War I, the young men of the day left their place of work and to the call of Lord Kitchener, headed in their tens of thousands to the trenches of France and Belgium. Filling the void at home, it would be the women of the country who stepped up to operate the trains and buses, work the land and man the shipyards and armament factories. By 1917 there would be 700,000 women employed in the armaments industries. Armstrong Whitworth, as an independent armament manufacturer, would be at the forefront of field gun and shell supply for the war effort. Their main works were based at Scotswood and Elswick on the banks of the River Tyne. However, the extremely dangerous side of filling the shells with their high explosive charge led them to build fill factories in the more remote locations found at Derwent Hall and Leamington Point. Little has been written or is even known about our Canary Village. However, we learn the Banbury National Filling Factory No. 9 was built 
based on the Leamington layout. Research of Banbury shows multiple wooden buildings interconnected by wooden walkways and a railed trolley system. The different buildings would house different processes. Empty shells, paint and varnish, shell filling, packing and bond storage. Volatile chemicals would receive further protection with abundant earth wall surrounding their buildings. Banbury would have a workforce of 1500 and with Armstrong Whitworth supplying 14.5 million shells to the war effort, it is more than conceivable that Canary Island workers would number well over 1,000. As if to verify the amount of activity at Canary Island, we find some photographs identified as Bond 1101 Leamington. This is the shell storage end of the shell production. Not everyone makes it into the camera, but we count 83 young ladies in this Imperial War Museum pose. We note the amount of ammunition boxes in the background. With this photograph, we view the pouring of the explosive charge. Canary Island shell filling would be with lidite and TNT, lidite being made from picric acid and was named after lid in Kent, where it was developed. Both charges were made in block form and were then melted by steam and poured into the shell where they solidified. Their low melt point and high explosive point made them safe to handle and needing a detonator to make the explosion. Fire was seen as the main danger in the filling factories. Although picric acid became explosive if in contact with concrete and certain metals. There would be many explosions, some of them unexplained in the filling factories. Over 600 people were known to have been killed. The Leamington Point workers lived with danger every day. It's at this point we find out about the link between our Leamington factory and the local name for its location, Canary Island. Throughout the country in the early days of shell production, the filling with the explosive would be an unsophisticated process of melting the lidite or TNT, then pouring the liquid form into the shell. Munitionettes and even the cleaners and drivers would end up covered by the liquid and dust from the explosive charge. With both lidite and TNT containing a yellow pigment, the hands, faces and hair of the workers would take on a yellow, canary-like hue. It would be 1916, two years into the conflict, before the Ministry of Munitions would realise that handling TNT would have life-threatening consequences. During that year, the filling factories would report 51 deaths through toxic jaundice, attributed directly to the shell filling process. With sickness absenteeism running at over 10% in some factories and alarms spreading in the press, new regulations to address the situation came into play. Work areas would have to be clean and ventilated. Separate canteen facilities were to be provided with milk given away free. Protective clothing was to be supplied and washed at least weekly. Whole time medical 
and welfare staff were to be provided. The well kitted women workers and a nurse in attendance in this photograph would bear testament to time changes for the good at the Leamington factory. On a BBC Newcastle Sounds programme, Sheila Smith remembers Lempton's Canary Girls through her father's memories. She regales us with the Lempton Canaries earned very good wages and fur coats were common below the brilliant yellow colour of their hair. This portrayal shows three proud Lempton Canaries striding out down Montague Street as they head to another day at the factory. Their purpose and independence is signified by the wearing of fur coats over their overalls. Their yellow skin and hair is a badge of commitment to the war effort. In a world still seen as run by men and with still no right to an election vote, these women and thousands of others were leading the way in the fight for emancipation. It's October 1918 and we're weeks away from war's end. Our research finds no reports of deaths through toxic jaundice and there is no evidence of major explosions or accidents. With Canary Island just out of view to the left of this busy skyline, we can see that the Armstrong factory is not as remote as originally understood. It is in fact within close proximity to the local power station, the coal stathers and the glass works at full production for the war effort. Include the railway, road and river activity and we see over a thousand workers alongside the dangerous filling factory. And right on cue, on the 23rd of October 1918, a fire followed by explosions took place in a building where there were filled shells. Mr Richard Amos, the head foreman, with the assistance of a workman, Mr Thomas Bell, entered the building and extinguished the fire, despite a further explosion. The men had averted a disaster. For their gallantry, both men were awarded the Order of the British Empire. The presentation took place at Newcastle's Moot Hall and was made by the Duke of Northumberland with the Lord Mayor and a grateful Armstrong Whitworth management in attendance. After World War I in May 1919, we encounter the period where the munitions industries grind to a halt and become inactive. However, another major incident still takes place involving the Lemton Filling Factory. An Armstrong Whitworth barge, or wherry, makes a run from Leamington to Scotswood to pick up some concrete blocks for dumping at sea. When loading the wherry, there is a massive explosion that is heard nine miles away, resulting in house and shop windows being put out to a distance of two miles. Miraculously, there are no deaths, although 96 men are reported injured. At the inquest, the cause of the explosion is attributed to the presence of dried picric acid on the wherry deck. The wherry was carrying a pick rate of sodium sludge from the Leamington filling factory. Under normal circumstances the sludge was kept under water and was dumped out at deep sea. Loading the concrete blocks was against company procedures and had provided the spark to cause the explosion. 
Workshops adjacent to the quayside were extensively damaged, but were not in use at the time, thus saving Armstrongs from encountering multiple deaths. Less than two years after the conclusion of World War I, the Ministry of Munitions sold off its Canary Island inventory. Lathes, laundry machinery, jib cranes and even a steam locomotive are put up for sale. By the early 1930s, the old munitions village is demolished and Canary Island begins its drift into Leamington folklore. Today we revisit the old location and as we look around it's lost industries on the horizon with the coal staves, iron and glass works and the power station all long gone. We're now on Canary Island. Remember it's a peninsula, not an island. With the iconic glasswork dome in the background, we are surrounded by wild grass and shrubbery. An occasional concrete block is all that we find as we start to conclude our search. Finally, on the silted bed of the river, at the extreme end of the Leamington Gut, we make our most telling find. Surely among the old stairs and overgrown trees, we have found the remains of the Canary Island Bridge. We conclude our research by returning to this old photograph. On the back there are identified just a few of the heroic women and young ladies we now know as the Leamington Canaries of Canary Island. As we read out their names we remember all of the others whose dedication and bravery helped to bring World War I to its conclusion. Jenny Dowden, Elizabeth Storey from Newburn, the Noon Sisters and Josephine Edgar from Washington, Maggie Proudlock from Throckley, Edie Cummins from Klondike, Cramelton, Mrs Hanks, the forewoman from London and Elizabeth Sewell from Blue Ship.